got the signal to start, so we will get going. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming along. I heard this is clashing with happy hour, so I appreciate your sacrifice coming to this talk, but it's going to be great. Um, let's talk about hosting live multiplayer games. Um, I need this. So, I have this game. It is an asymmetrical multiplayer nacho eating simulator. It is the next big genre, I can tell. To my disappointment, my player counts have started out very small. I am disappointed. I think this game needs to get the recognition that it truly deserves. But one day, a Twitch streamer picks it up, and suddenly it's starting to get a bit more popular. The feedback is really good, and I'm starting to get a bit excited. Some free marketing. Over the next few days, more and more people are downloading my game to try it out. And I'm thinking, oh, this, this weekend peak is going to be really big. This is great. And then on the Friday night, uh, my phone rings. And I pick it up. It's my operations team. And they tell me everything is on fire. <laughs> everything has gone down. This is bad. So we have run out of servers. And players are getting really long queue times to try to get into a match. I've got some patchy servers that are just causing really bad performance. I've got players feeling like they're moving through treacle. They're getting kicked off a game halfway through. And the inevitable happens, which is I find a bug in the wild, and I've got to fix it. So this is my most critical point of my game. It's at the peak time, and I'm trying to think, do I want to take downtime to upgrade my game right now? You don't want this to be your player's experience when they come into your game, just when stuff was supposed to be getting really big. Instead, you're thinking about players having long queue times, patchy server performance, and potentially downtime for an update. Now, the last thing you want is your infrastructure to be the uh, victim of your game's success. You want your players to think about the game and not the game servers. This talk is going to be ho about hosting happy gamers and hopefully some happy devs along the way. This is also my contractual plug that we hosted Apex that I have to put into every single presentation that we do. <laughs> um, also, hands up who was starting to get a bit worried this whole talk was going to be an MS Paint and GIFs. Yeah, my marketing team are looking slightly relieved now that we've got into the real stuff. Uh, my name is Josie Messer. I'm a developer at Multiplay. Um, I do have a game about eating nachos, uh, but the rest of that story is not true. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be your tour guide today through the potholed wilderness that is cloud hosting, and we're going to talk about some of the challenges you're going to have to overcome to make sure that your game, if it gets that viral success, is a success. So let's get some terminology out of the way first. Um, when I talk about servers, and I'm going to talk about them a lot, I mean an application that is running somewhere. It's the one that your players are connecting to. This is opposed to a machine, which is the thing that's running the operating system. This might be a cloud machine or bare metal. We run multiple servers on one machine. That's just the cheapest way to do it. Now, let's get into our first scenario from that fated Friday night. We had long queue times. So let's dig into some of the questions that we need to answer to understand this problem. Namely, how do players get onto a server, and how do we choose which is the best server to host this game? For all of this, you'll want some kind of orchestration platform. In multiplayer, that is hosted behind the allocate endpoint. What this is doing is your, oh, so most of our customers use matchmakers. Um, you don't have to use a matchmaker, but for this talk, I'm going to use this as the example. It's just the simplest way to explain these concepts. Um, also, plug, I'm doing a talk tomorrow about matchmakers, so come along to that. So your matchmaker is going to be responsible for grouping your players, but the actual finding of the server, that's being delegated to multiplayer. So this is what this allocate call is. It's to say, find me a server that satisfies these requirements. 
Now, most of our customers are running in this hybrid scaling situation. This means that we have bare metal servers at the bottom. This is where you put all of your kind of guaranteed, your confident players that you're, you know are going to show up. And then you have cloud to go into, which gives you the flexibility. Bare metal might be cheap, but it's a big risk to pay for upfront. And cloud is flexible, but really expensive. So we have this nice format here. Now, the key takeaway of how this orchestration platform works is that we're going to allocate into the bare metal servers first, and then we're only going to use cloud when we need it. And this way, we can scale up and down into the cloud only when it's necessary. Now, what happens when your server finishes? This is a, a decision that Multiplay can't make for you, which is knowing when your session has ended. Maybe you have to update some player data, uh, achievement statuses, that kind of thing. We're not aware of what that looks like for you. So we need some kind of system to call and tell us to tear the server down to get it ready to be allocated again. The critical thing here is that once the server's been allocated, that's what the red means on these slides, when we come in to deallocate it, we actually leave the server running. And therefore, when the next allocation comes in, we haven't had to wait for the startup time. And this means that you don't have to wait when your matchmaker is saying, I need a server, I need a server, for those servers to start up. And this is just, it's just a little efficiency saving that we have in there. Because otherwise, this could become one of the bottlenecks to slow down your queue times. But what happens when you're hitting that allocate request and you start to run out of servers? Obviously, you need to think about scaling up. Now, the key thing here is obviously we only scale into the cloud. You can't get bare metal quick enough. No one wants to be sat on the phone trying to scale up with data centers. But scaling in the cloud takes a couple of minutes. And if you're fully reactive here, that would mean that every single time you need a new machine, your players would have to be waiting a couple of minutes for them to spin up. So we, don't, we want to avoid this situation. The way we do this is by having a buffer of servers. So this is this gap above the allocated servers in red and the total servers above it. And what this does is it means we can smooth out any sudden spikes that we get in load. You can think of this buffer as like a blanket running over the top of your allocated servers there. Now, your buffer is defined to be the number of servers in a particular state. The one that really helps people understand this is available servers. So a server is available if it is online but not allocated. So let's look at a real example for this. So say this is your whole environment and these are all your servers. The servers in red are allocated, the servers in green are available, so they haven't got a game session running on them. Your buffer is defined to be four available servers. As we start allocating, we're going to be slowly eating up all of the servers that we have in that available state. And eventually, you're going to eat into your buffer. Our whole scaling system is dedicated to just keeping this buffer full. The way that we can do this is either by turning on a machine or provisioning a whole new one if we don't have any that are shut down. And in this way, we can refill that buffer and make sure that it's always full. Now, when we're provision, talking about provisioning machines, we're talking about doing it from the cloud provider. Now, the problem with this is that it's going over the internet, and you're dealing with just general kind of infrastructure, especially at a large scale. So sometimes it has been known for entire cloud providers to go down. Or at a lesser extent, it might just be a location's gone offline for some reason, they've had a power cut. So your, fault, uh, your provisioning has to be fault tolerant and resilient. We're multi-cloud for this reason. It means that if there's a problem somewhere, we can just go and scale up somewhere else. So this means that your game isn't going to be affected by situations that were out of your control. And this keeps uh, meaning that whenever you're hitting that allocate endpoint, you know you are actually going to be able to get a server back. So we're looking at this, uh, this graph here. We're talking about scaling up machines. And you might have noticed in that diagram, we had a couple of extra servers, more than we needed. We'd gone over the buffer again. This is OK, because typically in that situation, we're scaling up anyway. So those servers are going to be needed. So sometimes that buffer might be a bit bigger than it needs to be. But when you get to this inflection point on the buffer, you have to think about scaling down. So 
The only reason that we scale down is to save money. If you had infinite funds, then you could just leave all of your servers running 24-7 and you wouldn't have to think about any of this. But obviously, that's not the case. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So and we now have to start thinking about, OK, well, how are we going to do this? The best way to do it is in cloud. You've got to think about shutting down or deleting whole machines. You can't operate on individual servers. It doesn't really make much of a difference. So we've got to think about which machines are the best candidates to shut down. OK, have you seen, has anyone seen this before? It's from XKCD, Randall Monroe's comic. Great, great comic, please check. Um, so this is his ideal fridge. So you've got different foods have different expiry dates. You put the food in the shelf where its expiry date is, the conveyor belt nudges it along, and then you know you've got to get the food that's on the right-hand side before it goes off, and eventually it gets into the bin at the bottom. This is essentially how multiplays scaling down works, although I'm sure no one would like me saying that, that it's like a fridge. Um, so machines get put in the fridge when they're unused. And that means that every single server on it is available, so it's not being used for a game session at the moment. Now, at any point, this uh, orchestration platform might come along and use a server on that machine if it's needed. And that means that we're going to take the machine out of the fridge. But if it stays along and it kind of starts chugging along that conveyor belt, we'll get to a point where we know it's not going to be needed immediately. And for that reason, we then shut it down. The really nice thing about this is that when we're scaling up, as I mentioned earlier, we can turn on machines. And so the scale up actually looks in this kind of middle section of the fridge for machines to bring back online. And those are the quickest ones to bring on new capacity. Provisioning machines takes a couple of minutes, and as we were saying, that can be too long. So instead, we just have ones that are in this standby state. They can be turned on, and you've got servers straight away, as opposed to having to provision, install, all this kind of stuff. But eventually, as they're chugging along the conveyor belt, if nothing's come to turn them on or nothing's taken them out of the fridge, they'll get onto this right-hand side. And what that means is that they're about, they're definitely not used. We, we've, they've been in there for a couple of days, usually. And so we can be sure that they're not going to be used for, like, this is one of your longer term kind of scale down scenarios. And at this point, we just delete them. And therefore, you're only paying for the servers that you need, you aren't, uh, sorry, that you do need to use. This means that we're not scaling down too aggressively, just for the sake of cost. We're keeping machines in this nice middle state. We call it warm capacity, although with the fridge analogy, that doesn't work too well, so I'm not going to stay on that topic too long. Um, and it means that we can scale up when we need to without kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. So our scaling system, this isn't a real graph, by the way, of what scaling looks like. You've got those total servers running along the top, which is the yellow line, and then you've got the green underneath. The reason for the, the, the plateau on either side is because we hit bare metal at that point, and we, there's, there's no benefit in scaling down. You've paid for them anyway, so you might as well leave them online. So that's what's going on there. Um, so the whole point of our scaling system is just to keep that buffer just full enough. We have to keep it full, but we never want to scale down below that. And we want to have those machines in that middle part of the fridge ready to come back online when they need it. Our orchestration platform is aware of this too. And so it's making sure that it's allocating machines, so well, servers on machines, in an intelligent way that plays nicely with our scaling system. On top of all of this, our provisioning is fault tolerant. And this means that we can remain resilient. And as I say, make sure whenever you're hitting that allocate endpoint, you know you're going to have enough servers to satisfy the request. So next scenario from the Friday night Nacho story was patchy server performance. So we've solved those long queue times. This is the next one that we've got to solve. Now, we're in, when we're talking about games that go really big, you're basically into Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. If you're operating thousands of servers, running on thousands of machines, you're guaranteed you're going to have one that's got a dodgy stick of RAM that's causing flipped bits. You might have a network card that's just dropping some packets on the floor because it can, and why not? Your game's also going to be put through its paces, 
which means that suddenly your players might start doing things you weren't expecting them to do. Uh, an operating system a patch might come in and suddenly introduce a new bug into your game. The critical thing here is not to think about how to avoid every single one of these scenarios. It's just about being aware that they're going to happen and how to prevent them. We recommend putting server query into your game as early as you possibly can. And the, the truth is, is something's going to go wrong in development. That's why we kind of call it development. And so catching it early and failing early is really important, especially long before your players get onto any servers and have expectations about how the game is going to run. On top of all of this, this gives you a window into your game. So you want to start to build up an idea of what is normal, and so when stuff starts to misbehave, you know exactly what that looks like. On the machine that this server is running on, we also have performance monitoring. And this is telling us whether or not the machine is misbehave, sorry, the server is starting to misbehave on the machine. So we have this set of monitoring and control tools. And these are responsible for keeping your machines running and healthy. We're sending health check updates on a regular basis. And what this means is, for example, if a service stops responding to query, we can just kill it off. If you have a memory leak, for example, then we want to make sure that if one server is misbehaving, it's not about to consume all of the memory on the entire machine. We take the strategy here of the greater good. I hope some of you have seen Hot Fuzz, otherwise you might be confused by this reference. So we're talking about having saving the whole machine's worth of servers and just killing off one because we'd prefer that situation. So we produce these kind of graphs for our customers based on the data that we're collecting from machines. This is uh, the CCU graph for the first couple of days of a game launch. It's really important, given that we're going to be acting on the, the data that we're getting out of those servers, so we will kill them off if we see it, that we're building up really accurate data. When we're hosting game servers, we're constantly seeing like a really transient environment. So we've got people allocating servers and deallocating servers. We have players moving from one server to another. We're when we're calculating whether or not we need to scale up or scale down, we need to have a clear picture of what the environment looks like. For this reason, we take a snapshot of our environment whenever we need to gather these kind of reliable metrics. So in this example here, uh, all of the boxes around the outside are representing the machines that we're monitoring, and in the middle is like our metrics database. Now, if we want to find out how many players you have in your system, then if we took um, query updates every couple of seconds, then we'd see some player drift, and we'd be double accounting for players. Instead, we make sure that all of these machines are running NTP, so they're all running exactly the same time. And then at the top of the minute, we make a query update request to the server from the machine. So this means we get the exact piece of information at the exact same time all across the world. Now, if we were to then send that information back as soon as we got it, we might end up like DDoSing ourselves. And this is a problem that Multiplay have, is we don't want to be the victims of our own success either. Um, so we wait a couple of seconds before we report the uh, information back. So in this way, we stagger all of the responses from all of the machines. It's like a random number of seconds. What this means is that the information is persisted a couple of seconds after it was actually collected. It doesn't need to be real time. People are OK finding out like 30 seconds later what their metrics actually looks like. But the data that we've gathered is really reliable. With all of this data, it means that when you do call that allocation endpoint, and our service, uh, the orchestration platform is looking at which servers to satisfy that request, we can just make sure that any misbehaving servers get taken out of the available pool. And this way, we're not going to be exposing your players to a bad server or machine. Similarly, if you've got an entire location or something that's misbehaving, we were talking about the fault-tolerant provisioning earlier. We just take that out of rotation. And so when Murphy's Law does occur, we just remove it. The important thing is not knowing how to fix these problems all the time. And thankfully, we do have a 24-7 support team on hand who will fix it. 
It's about making sure that you know when something is misbehaving so that your players don't ever get put onto those servers. So my final scenario was my having to take downtime to update my server. Now, you don't always have to take downtime when you're updating. And this is the critical part, is how can we do this in an efficient way? So live games are kept alive by this live, regular cadence of releases. It might be a balance patch, it might be a bug fix, something like that. And we want to make sure that the more often that we're pushing out these updates, that the players just don't notice. So you can also prevent your players from really noticing that you're doing this by just making updates to the game server. Game clients, updates obviously involve an, uh, them having to install the update, and so they can't get into the server until they've done that. And so by being able to just update the server, if you can do it invisibly, then you can be fixing stuff as much as you like. Because I feel like this, this is the most believable scenario here. It's like we've all pushed out something, and then there's a bug in it, and it's only found until it's got into production. So multiplayer's way of doing this is uh, with zero downtime patching. So what's happening here is we've got players per profile. So this is just the version that the uh, servers are running. And as games are naturally finishing, we're seeing this drop off on the right hand side here. And then as the new version comes up on the green uh, line there, that way you can see that the curve is just kind of continuing in its natural way that it was going to. So this way we don't have to spin up like double the capacity to be able to update the game servers. We actually do it on the machines that are running live games. What this means is that you have game servers hosting players and then an image update is happening in the background. So we've got to make sure that this is invisible, that the players don't notice this is happening. What we're talking about installing is this server image. So this is just a bundle of everything that makes a fully functioning game server. So that might be a game server executable, as well as any assets or config files that need to go in there. When you first get your image into a multiplayer system, you'll provide us with this full image. The nice thing is, though, is that the more you work with us, you'll get to the point where you only want to apply an update. And at this point, we can just take a diff of the server image. So as we're distributing out the, ch the, uh, the update, we're only distributing the changes. We're not doing the whole thing. So especially when your images are gigabytes big, then this isn't a scenario that you have to worry about. So how do we do it? The first thing that we've got is a primary mirror. This is like a really beefy box that is dedicated to distributing these images down to all of your game servers. So ultimately, we want to get down to this bottom row here, which is the machines. Now, if every single one of those machines decided it wanted to download the image from the primary mirror, we might see some problems when we've got you know, tens of thousands of machines running in our environment. So we have local mirrors sitting in between. Now, the, every single machine has a local mirror defined for it. This means that you're guaranteed to have a good network connection between your machine and the local mirror. Now, what happens is once the image is on the primary mirror, the machines get notified that there's a new update to install. The machines then say, OK, well, I want to download that. So they go to their local mirror and ask for that image. The local mirrors haven't got it yet, though. It's only made it to the primary mirror. So the mirrors then request it from that top one. So we have this pull system rather than a push. And there's a good reason for doing that. So this is your local mirror downloading the image onto it. And these are the machines at the bottom, which are then going to be downloading that image. Rather than having to wait for the full image to download onto the local mirror and then that replicate it onto the machines underneath. We instead stream the image as it's being downloaded. So this means that once a blob of data has arrived on the local mirror, it just can immediately be replicated down onto those machines. This is why we have a pull system, is so that the machines are ready to start streaming that data straight off of their local mirror. So now we've got the image being downloaded onto the host machine. We need to think about 
how are we going to install this image without the players on the servers noticing? Because these servers might be allocated and running live games. The biggest thing we have to avoid here is any kind of resource contention. So it might be CPU or network I.O., disk I.O., this kind of stuff. So if you were downloading a program from the internet yourself, you'd probably end up downloading it into a temporary file. Oh, we decompress, we need to decompress the image as well, as the whole thing has been distributed as it, in a compressed format, obviously. So we need to decompress it, and then we need to get it into this install directory at the bottom. Now, that would mean three sets of write operations on the machine, which we want to avoid, because that could cause an issue if the game servers are trying to load anything off the disk at the same time. So we only do it once. We have the download going into an in-memory buffer. And what this means is that the amount of, uh, that we can download at a time is actually restricted by the size of that buffer. We're then decompressing on the fly as we get the data into that buffer and writing it to its install directory once. So we only have one set of write operations as opposed to maybe two or three. This is a single threaded process as well. So what this means is that we're restricting the amount of CPU it can use as well. And as this is capped by the size of that memory uh, in-memory buffer, we can't download anymore either. So we're restricting the network I.O. in this as well. So all of this means is that we can install a whole new image without the, game, uh, the players on those game servers even noticing. So finally, you've got that image onto your machine. You want to make sure that you can actually use it. That's kind of the point of the whole exercise. So say you're running version 1. You want to switch over to version 2. I was talking about that allocate endpoint earlier on and that you have to specify the details of the server that you want. One of the things that you specify is the version. So say the game's just finished on this bottom server here, and then an allocate request comes in saying, OK, I want to run version 2 now. All we do is stop the game server and start it up on version 2. As far as your players are concerned, the amount of time it took to update your game server was as long as your game server took to start up. And they didn't even notice that the download was happening in the background. So all of this means it doesn't matter how many times you break your server out in the wild. As long as you can push updates to it and you can do these invisible updates, you know that you can always fix it when you need to. And you'll never have to take downtime for server updates. So, back to my Nacho game. This is what I was faced with when I was uh, thinking about what on earth we were going to do to fix this scenario. But now, so we're thinking about like, how can we scale up proactively? How can we make sure that we have an orchestration system that is aware of what my scaling up and down processes are going to be? I'm making sure I'm not scaling down too aggressively just to save money and keeping some servers lying around ready to go when they needed it. I'm also able to remove any bad servers out of the pool so that my games are always going to have reliable performance on them. And finally, I'm able to make sure that I can fix and push out any new content that I need to without them even noticing. So maybe your Friday night could turn into just watching the CCU graph going up something like this. Um, Thank you very much. I am joined by a couple of other members from the multiplayer team. So Ben and Yasek. Oh, they're sat in the middle back there. Um, if you want to come talk to me or them, there's a load of other multiplayer people around. We tend to hang out at the Connected Games desks on the expo floor. So please do come and say hello to us. I'm also going to do a shameless plug before I get dragged off the stage. So um, Caleb and I are talking at 9 AM tomorrow morning about the matchmaker. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail about the orchestration stuff there, but the matchmaker is super cool, so that's another thing you're not going to have to worry about. Uh, Larry has a talk on games as a service. I think that's at midday. And there's obviously the Madfinger talk tomorrow afternoon as well, which is a case study that makes use of all of this kind of stuff. So please come and check it out if you're interested, and I'll come and say hello. So thank you very much, and I will take questions.
I've been, there's a microphone up in the corner if you're super keen, or if you just yell at me, I can repeat what you said. So, have anyone got anything? If not, you can go to happy hour early, which I appreciate. <laughs> cool? Okay. I'll take that as a no. So, thank you very much for listening, guys. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you um, outside. Thank you. Thank you.